So this may be a little outside the norm for Nightmares on the Lost Highway, but I have been a wrestling fan since the, the days of Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior and Andre the Giant. Mm. And You're the, talking my era. The glory days of wrestling, Junkyard if you Junkyard dog. And- it got so bad that in the mid-90s and, and into the early 2000s, when I was going to college, I was going to night school, and I would not schedule a class on a Monday night <laughs> so I could be home to watch Raw and Nitro. Monday Night Raw. So, you know, in, in a world filled with, with such larger-than-life characters, I mean, you literally have a man who was raised from the dead and his brother who he burned in a house fire as a child. You have post-apocalyptic warriors and, you know, straight up fresh off the farm, redneck, you know, hog farmers. <laughs> you have a larger than life, eighth wonder of the world giant, you know, and, and you know, you have midget wrestlers. You have and wrestling everything in between. Wrestling encompasses everything in this big grand circus of wrestling. And for however twisted and strange the stories on the screen might be, sometimes the behind the scenes stories are are even worse and and far far more scary than than what's really going on so we wanted i we wanted i wanted to do an episode on the dark side of wrestling from a child born into this world we are taught what to believe close-minded we become fearful to be deceived still we desire to know what lies beyond that locked door the art of the storyteller conjuring tales of legend and lore History hidden, lost knowledge, things forgotten, and the unknown. These are the things that direct us and will set the tone. Welcome, friends, to another episode of Nightmares on the Lost Highway. So, Eric, as we were talking, I know that wrestling isn't really your wheelhouse. I've been... It used to be. I mean, more, back in the mid-80s, I, yeah. y- you mentioned like Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, uh, Junkyard Dog, Ricky the Dragon, Steamboat. <laughs> I mean, I, I can go on and on, you know. That was my era. And I fell into it at still a, a young age, but the question was still there, is this real? Yeah. You know, I was kind of in that era. And then I think it was as I you know, graduated out of high school and, and started in the job force and going to college at night and, and such. I just kind of lost interest when I found out my bubble was crushed, that it wasn't all real. Now see Eric, <laughs> but let's, let's look at the topic of, of real star Wars. Isn't real. Oh my gosh. You Lord, had to bring star Wars. Into Lord this. of the Rings isn't real. Those things aren't real, but you still watch the movies and enjoy them. I think, and I'm showing some ignorance here. I think it goes back to the fact that I thought it could be real. And I go into Star Wars and Lord of the Rings just because I love Dungeons and Dragons. And it's not that I thought it was real. It was just, hey, this is, um, this is right up my alley. But I had mugs. I had T-shirts. I had the action figures, those, the rubber hard ones made by LJN that you could throw across the room and knock your cousin out with. I grew up in that era. And then I will say, now, as... When I got married uh, to my wife, Sarah, we had some other couples and Michelle and Tim Anderson. He was super interesting. Like to your point, every Monday night, his mother had cable. So that's every Monday night they went to his mom's house to watch. And she did as well. And he, he brought me back into it and I was in it, but just not as much. It was kind of one of those deals. Okay. It's on. I'll watch it. I'm, I'm not joking when I said I would not schedule a class for a Monday night so that I could watch wrestling as a matter of fact i would say the first big thing that me and my wife did together was i'd always promised my brother and sister we would go to a wwe pay-per-view oh and that would be that would be awesome wwf no mercy 2001 was in st louis and i bought four tickets and, and i even remember my mom going well you're dating this girl what if she doesn't want to go what if she doesn't like wrestling i'm like I'm sure I can find someone that will go watch a pay-per-view with me. If my girlfriend doesn't like wrestling, I'll find a girlfriend that does. We made a day of it. (laughs) We we packed up the car. We went up there. We met Mick Foley at a book signing. Oh, wow. And then we went to the pay-per-view, and and we we got to be- I never, as many years as I've known you, I never knew that story. Yeah. And so it was one of the first big things. Now, is wrestling fake? Let's ask that question. Is wrestling fake? Wrestling is scripted. Yes. Like stage play. Much like a lot of wrestlers would say, I would not say wrestling's fake. What they do is real. 
They're real, real athletes. athletes. They're Touché. really putting their lives and livelihood on the line every time they get in the ring. All it takes is one mistake for one of these guys to be permanently injured. Yeah, break their neck, break yeah. their back. I, I totally agree with that so aspect. It is scripted, but your favorite TV show is scripted. So, yes, I would say Lost is fake, but, you know. It, it's, it's really not that different from a stage play. No. You go and you watch a stage play, and there are people that get up, and whether they sing or dance or yeah. do whatever. It, yeah, I give you that. So the, these guys do put on a show. Again, amazing athletes. Some of these guys, you know, John Cena is arguably one of the strongest men on the planet. And then you have Mark Henry, who's a professional wrestler, who is certifiably one of the strongest men on the planet. He he holds records for feats of strength, you know, all over the world. So, again, for all the drama and action that happens in the ring, there is just as much that happens outside. Especially if you go back a few years, wrestling origins come from like the old carnival days. And let's be honest, you know, carnies and whatnot. It's kind they of had a, a circus reputation. environment uh, in some ways. And, and so when you take a bunch of guys who are these, these alpha male types, these super strong, uh, in some cases back in the older days of wrestling, steroid taking, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. there, there's going to be things that happen that just aren't expected, aren't planned, and, and are, are not good. And with, with the business we had there with you know Raven's Loft, we traveled around, we did a lot of comic cons. I've met a lot of the wrestlers that were, for whatever reason, at different cons. Most of the ones I have met are the most down-to-earth, kind people. But one of the things I learned, which is a dark side of its own, is how especially these early wrestlers in that platform, and I'll say that because wrestling, of course, goes back, you know, centuries, but at that time frame, how these companies treated them. Oh yeah. Yeah. Improper. Like not, some of them had no insurance. No, m- most, no, no retirements, nothing to take care of themselves. WWE still does not have medical insurance technically. And alleged, if you want to use that word, I think we would pretty much all agree though. A lot of them would be like, you know, their main stars hurting. We'll take this, take these pills, take this injection, go out, do the show, buddy. They are, that that alone is dark. I one, mean, one of the saddest things I've ever seen in relation to wrestling is an interview with Roddy Piper when he says there is no retirement plan in wrestling. So you either take care of yourself so you can do it until you've made enough money to retire or you don't make it that far. Yeah. And he said, so you got to be 65 to draw retirement. He goes, I'm never going to retire. And if that's the, if that's, you know, yeah. And he, 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 he died of cancer in like 63, I think he, and, and then I made a point, you know, I grew up with all the wrestling figures and all that. And of course I'm a huge vintage toy collector and, and all that with the shop, but those wrestlers for the most part, none of them saw a dime off, you know, the Hulk Hogan never saw those original back, you know, money from that stuff. Here's the thing. I saw, I saw a list of like WWE contracts and what was being paid out. Something got released from like 10, 15 years ago. Some of those guys, I mean, seriously, for what they go through and what they do, some of those guys were barely making more money than I do right now. Yeah. Yeah. And and you're talking. And putting their life in danger. And a lot of times they, they're they responsible for all their own travel expenses and all that. So it, it's, it's, it's an industry that definitely needs reform. It needs to be treated a little differently. And, and I think. Uh, companies like AEW are definitely trying to yes. do that and be that a little different. That was one of their big lures to pull yeah. a lot of the wrestlers. Uh, WWE is still, you know, may, may, WWE has recently announced that they're going to be sold to the parent company of UFC. I don't know if they're any better, but hopefully you'll see some changes in the business. But anyway, anyway, I could go on about wrestling for forever, but we're here to talk about some some controversies and some tragedies. So I thought one of my more favorite stories infamous stories i don't want to say it's a good story but i was going to talk about the mass transit incident all right which sounds a lot scarier than it actually is <laughs> kick us off so this occurred at an ecw house show on november 23rd in 1996 if you're unfamiliar with wrestling terms i'm going to try to fill in some gaps here but a house show is just a wrestling event that happens that's not on tv wwf does them all the time they they tour the country you go to a house show. It's usually an opportunity for wrestlers that haven't been seen before to get a little in-ring experience before they make it to television. I got to see Brock Lesnar before he was on TV once at a house show. So, nice. I mean, things like that. Like, you get to see these guys before they get, you know, make a name for themselves. So, 17-year-old Eric Kulos was an aspiring pro wrestler, and he was using the name Mass Transit. 
And the character he played in the ring, if you want to bear with me here, was based on Ralph Cramden from the Honeymooners. So again, you talk about kind of strange characters in the ring being Ralph Cramden, who was a bus driver in the Honeymooners. Uh, that's a weird wrestling character. <laughs> but that's, who, you know, he wore the, the bus driver uniform and the hat and everything. He offered to fill in for a wrestler who was unable to make the show in a tag team match against the gangsters, New Jack and Mustafa Saeed. Now, New Jack has a heck of a reputation in the wrestling business. New Jack does not mess around. Let's just say if you're going to wrestle New Jack, you're going to get hurt. He, he's, he's a rough guy. Now, he told the owner of the company, Paul Heyman, uh, that he was 21 and he had trained with the legendary Killer Kowalski. Now, Killer Kowalski is a legendary wrestler and he's trained like China and I think Triple H. You know, a lot of those big names have worked with him. So before the match, backstage in the locker room area, Kulas asked New Jack to blade him. And blading is the act of, of cutting yourself intentionally for effect. A lot of times you'll see someone take a big shot to the head and they'll go down to the mat and they'll rub their forehead. Well, they're, they're cutting themselves so that they, you know, they can get some blood and it'll look you know look more legit look real like i said kulas asked new jack to blade him he'd never done this before new jack was on board Pff, hey, i'll cut you man i got no problem with that because again that's new jack he don't care uh so at one point the gangsters the gangsters no r sorry were double teaming kulas inside the ring hitting him with all man manner of objects crutches toasters whatever <laughs> ecw was known for this they were a hardcore wrestling promotion towards the end of the match new jack used a surgical scalpel Oh, to cut Kulas. What part of this sounds like a good idea? Yeah, no, that's uh, a lot of them take a little piece of razor blade or whatever. They, they're they mm. not using surgical equipment. New Jack did cut way too deep, and he severed two arteries in Kulas's forehead. Dang. He was bleeding. Kulas screamed in pain and then almost immediately passed out from blood loss. Uh, fan footage of the event would later be used in the legal proceedings, included a moment where New Jack did ask him if he was all right, and then they continued to beat him up. The uh, show must go on. His his father, Kulas's father, would eventually scream. You can hear it on the video. Ring the effing bell. He's 17. He's only 17. Oh, my. Yep. And so medics rushed to the ring to tend to him. And New Jack, of course, being the wrestler and the showman and the arguably insane madman that he is, grabbed a microphone and shouted into it, I don't care if this... MF or dies. He's white. I don't like white people. I don't like people from Boston. <laughs> I am the wrong N word to F with. Oh, wow. Trying to keep it family friendly. Family friendly there. Beep, 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 beep. Three years after the incident, New Jack was tried on charges of assault and battery with a dangerous weapon and later sued by the Kulas family. However, after hearing that Kulas asked Jack to cut him, the jury acquitted him and he was later found not liable in civil court. Well, and he did lie about his yeah. age, too, so there's that. Now, according to a later interview, New Jack claimed that he did tell Kulas before the match that this is not a good idea. So he did give him an opportunity, but apparently he insisted. Upon his death in May of 2021, New Jack never expressed remorse for the incident, with his final tweet reiterating that Kulas had requested the cut. I've seen video of New Jack in the ring. He, before he died, he, I mean, he was, he was out to hurt people. He was one of those people that I think got into wrestling for the wrong reason. He got his jollies off on that. Well, I'm going to touch on one um, I'm going to say uh, a little less known to some of the wrestlers out there. I may get boos and heckles, but uh, Travis Banks. Travis made his debut in 2009. First few years, uh, mostly overseas wrestling in uh, the New Zealand area. In 2012, he got his first big break when he was flown to Japan to participate in an event called Zero One. It was during this event that he would make the connections and get the attention that was needed to come to America to wrestle. In 2016, he made what we assume was a rebirth for this uh, athlete, and he moved to England and did just that. A dramatic and important time where Travis Banks truly reinvented himself, his appearance, and and uh, got tattoos and some different things. Now, over the next several years, Banks really began to shine in the limelight and made quite a name for himself on the Brit wrestling scene uh, with very noted fandoms. Um, I believe in one article I read, he was in the top three of the Brit wrestling scene. Now, wrestling uh, event organizers were drawn to Banks, and he'd become kind of a well-trusted, uh, especially for intercontinental and foreign signing or event special events. Uh, because he had kind of bounced around and did some time in New Zealand and all this. He was kind of their go-to, and he kind of helped link all that together. 
to a point in 2018, in the prime of his career, he was the holder of the coveted Progress World title as well as the definitive Internet title at the same time. WWE comes on the scene and signs him in 2019 to be part of their new overseas branding company. And things just seem to get better and better. He was flown several times to the United States to participate in some key events and some promotions, probably best known to appear in the World's Collide 2020 event, alongside with the likes of Angel Garza, Isaiah Swervo, uh, Scott, and Jordan Devlin. Now, during the Speaking Out event of 2021, Banks found himself being called out by a British female wrestler, Mitty McKenzie stating Banks often verbally abused her uh, during secret romantic relationship the two apparently had while she was training with him at the young age of only 17. She proved her case by showing several screenshots of conversations back and forth between the couple. Travis Banks officially responded with the following statement. Now here he calls her Millie. Uh, Mitty is what I had before, but Millie was a trainee of mine at Fight Club Pro. She was also a close personal friend. We would be at shows together, attend some of the same social events, travel together, and hang out in a wrestler's house where I was living. It was through this friendship and consensual relationship was formed. The relationship broke down between both parties and it ended. After it ended, we agreed to talk about it. We apologized to each other for the individual actions behind the relationship breakdown. After seeing these comments, I can only repeat my apology. I am truly sorry for any pain caused by the relationship um now to me that seems to say a lot without really saying a lot (laughs) if you catch my drift he doesn't deny the relationship he actually confirms it uh he doesn't necessarily respond to the whole under age of 17 but admits she was training with him during the time frame when she was 17 and he also just happens to apologize for anything that caused pain (laughs) in the relationship so I guess uh, he did do that, but yeah, a little bit too, too little too late. Now, with all these accusations and in response, WWE immediately released Travis Banks from contract, and that should have been the end of it. But as you might expect with these stories, it wasn't. Travis Banks still wrestles even today in 2023. He actually went into hiding in Mexico and is quite often seen performing for the Underground Promotions Company wrestling in events along the likes of Marty Skrull and Alberto Del Rio, who we'll talk about a little bit later. So here again, we have a, talking about Dark Side, a wrestler who actually made his break into WWE, undoubtedly one of the best well-known, gets accused during that, the the coming out uh, statements that he had a relationship, sexual relationship with a 17-year-old girl that he was training and pretty well admits to it. WWE is a tr- publicly traded company. They kind of have to protect their image. There for a while, they even tried to be PG. I think, and, and that would be very difficult. Well, you're you're talking about. I mean, it's it's literally a show about people beating each other up. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I can definitely see them wanting to protect their image if something like that popped up. So I'm going to move on to the murder of Bruiser Brody. Now, if you're familiar with wrestling, you're familiar with Bruiser Brody. Bruiser Brody was a big guy, big I mean, boy, looked almost like a caveman, long hair. Uh, would would kind of roar at people, I think, almost. I mean, he was he was a big, scary guy, and he, he was also known for a hardcore style of wrestling. Now, he was born with the name Frank Goodish, which I always found kind of ironic, considering he would later become Bruiser Brody. And you didn't know, quite he, have goodish. that same shudder of the tongue. He he would become synonymous with a hardcore style of wrestling, and would often see one or more of the participants in the ring bleeding by the time the match was over. And he was very protective of his in-ring image. He hardly ever agreed to lose matches, with, and he built a reputation for being a volatile character. And he would, on occasion, intentionally hurt and, or in, you know, try to, to hinder his opponents in a match. One good example of this is when Lex Luger was, mm-hmm. was first becoming a, a, a well-known name. He was re- wrestling Bruiser Brody, and, and you can say he tried to take some liberties with him. You know, he was this young hot shot, and he thought he knew what he was doing. Well, somewhere in the middle of the match, Bruiser Brody just decides he's had enough. And this is a cage match, mind you, so they're in a steel cage. And he just starts no-selling, which is basically every every time Lex Luger would hit him, he would just shrug it off. It had no effect on the guy. And eventually, he would start throwing real punches and kicks. 
And, I mean, it got so bad that Lex Luger climbed the cage to escape and, and fled to the backstage area. Like, he was legit afraid of this guy. Getting a butt whooping. So, now, despite his reputation, his family knew a different side of him. Uh, his second wife, Barbara Smith, is, is went on to say that while his wrestling persona was known for brutality and being an uncontrollable monster, he was the complete opposite with his family. And, and Brody and her lived in Texas and together with their son, uh, Jeffrey Dean. And I've seen some video of it. I mean, apparently by, he was an amazing family man, very, very gentle, loving father, you know, and, and I mean, even when he went on his final tour, which when, when he went to Puerto Rico, you know, like last thing, you, you know, you, you, Hey, I'm going to be back soon, buddy. Don't worry. You know, blah, 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 that, that kind of stuff. Like he, he truly cared. Yeah. He, he loved his family. Now Brody would die on July 16th, 1988 from stab wounds suffered in a backstage brawl. He was in the, the locker room before his match. Uh, with fellow wrestler Dan Spivey at the Juan Ramon Lubriel Stadium in Bayamon, a city near uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, when Jose Huertes Gonzalez, a fellow wrestler and, and the booker of the promotion, the guy who decides the storylines, mm-hmm. allegedly asked him to step into the shower area to discuss business. Now, you know, Bruce Brody was a businessman. You know, he was in the wrestling business to make money. So there was apparently an argument between the two and a fight ensued. And due to the dressing room layout, there were no witnesses. Like, the shower was kind of around a corner with walled off. Uh, two screams were heard, loud enough for the entire locker room to hear. Tony Atlas ran into the shower. Now, Tony Atlas was a was a, another big brawler at the time and well-known you know wrestler. I believe he, he went to the Olympics at one point. And he runs in there, and he sees Brody bent over holding his stomach. And he looks up and, and sees God, Gonzalez standing there with a bloody knife in his hand. I mean, it seems pretty cut and dry. Seems. Now, due to the heavy traffic outdoors and the large crowd around the stadium, it took paramedics almost an hour to get to Brody. Uh, When they arrived, Atlas helped carry him downstairs to the ambulance because Brody was so big the paramedics couldn't carry him. I mean, Brody was a mod. He was like probably close, six and a half foot tall, at least 300 and some odd plant. I mean, he was a big guy. Brody would go on to die from the wounds. Now, Gonzalez claimed it was self-defense and testified, you know, in court. Uh, He was acquitted of murder in 1989, but you know, witnesses that lived outside of Puerto Rico weren't able to show up for the case. And that would include the likes of Tony Atlas and Dan Spivey, you know, people that were there. Uh, most of them didn't even receive their summons until after the trial was over. Oopsie. Now, apparently, the Gonzalez was a big name in Puerto Rican wrestling. He was like a hero to them. And it was they, they were known to protect his image in Puerto Rico. Might come down to a case of uh, being blackballed, yeah. too. Yeah. So fellow wrestlers Dutch Mantel and Tony Atlas have gone on to say that in the 1970s when Brody and Gonzalez first started to wrestle each other, Brody had wrestled very roughly and had actually, you know, beat him up legitimately in the ring. And and S.D. Jones said that one time after one of these matches where Gonzalez legit took a butt whooping, he said to him in the locker room, one day I'm going to kill that man. So And so shall it be. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to jump right back in kind of where I left off with uh, Alberto Del Rio. Made his debut in 2010 uh, in the WWE scene with SmackDown. Now, he was about 10 years into his career at this point. He'd already wrestled for uh, AAA, CMML, CMLL, sorry, and some other brandings, especially in and around Florida. I was going to say, those are, those are Mexican companies. So Alberto Del Rio was uh, pushed to the top uh, in the limelight with WWE very, very quickly. Yep. Even to a point of competing against and winning against Rey Mysterio. Uh, Just a few months later, he would have a world title match at TLC in 2010, which he unfortunately did not win. But hey, still not bad exposure for a wrestler within the new WWE branding to participate even within the first six months of his career there. He went on to be the single winner uh, of the 2011 40-man Royal Rumble match, which guaranteed him a position in the vastly popular WrestleMania. That is a main event title shot for winning the Royal Rumble. Now, things did not line up for him at WrestleMania, unfortunately, but still, uh, while he may not have been a winner, he definitely didn't walk away being a loser. But WWE, they weren't done pushing and promoting him yet. So he went on to participate and win in Raw's event, Money in the Bank, where he took the suitcase defeating CM Punk, declaring him the winner at uh, the WWE SummerSlam event. That year was quite turbulent with the WWE scene. And no one seemed to really want Alberto Del Rio declared the winner of that year's WrestleMania. Still, WWE was obviously not done with their golden child. 
and they continued to push over the next several years, to the point where he even won the heavyweight champion off and on. Uh, Then in 2014, just like that, WWE dropped Alberto Del Rio like a hot potato, notingly for unbecoming conduct, is all that was stated. Allegedly, we found out later that he had slapped a worker for making a racial joke directly at him for his nationality. Del Rio would return to WWE just a year later, and in his first scheduled event, winning the U.S. title, so immediately back in the WWE limelight. But this is where everything would just go off the rails and stay off the rails. It was during this time that Del Rio and a female wrestler by the name of Paige became interested and romantically involved. Officially in May of 2016, and they were quickly engaged in October of that same year. Now, during the relationship, Del Rio once again found himself out of the WWE, having what some described as a nuclear heated argument with the business portion of WWE. Now, Paige's parents, family, and friends all begged her to break things off with Del Rio. They felt they were not a good match, and he definitely was not good for her. Still, Paige stood by her man. Then the first documented report reared its ugly face in 2017, where the couple had a public fight in the middle of the Orlando airport. A full-blown investigation ensued, and stories began to come forward of domestic disputes between the couple that had alleged been going on for quite some time. While investigating, a bystander leaked an audio file of the airport event. There you can clearly hear the screaming, and at one point you can hear Del Rio stating, He is going to call the cops on Paige. Paige then fires back, leave me the F alone and get out of my life. After the investigation, all charges were dropped and the couple separated that same year. While out of the WWE, Del Rio continued to find himself in troubled situations. In 2020, he was arrested for allegedly battering and assaulting his, at that time, girlfriend. This guy's got a temper. He's got a temper. Now, later that same year, in 2020, he was brought up on yet more charges of assault and kidnapping as well as sexual assault. Wow. The trial just kept getting delayed and getting delayed until finally in December of 2021, the whole thing was just dropped and he walked away free. Nowadays, being blackballed from every major and minor U.S. wrestling organizations, (laughs) he is hiding out in Mexico, again in the underground wrestling arenas. Now, contrary to what you might hear from Del Rio himself, he keeps claiming, I will be back to WWE. However, WWE has stated, no way, no how. I believe you and I were talking, and you had heard very recently that... I think he just came back, and I might be right, I think it's with Impact Wrestling, which is uh, the descendant of what used to be the NWA wrestling promotion. Okay. I believe he just came back as an authority figure type character for them. Uh, He's not back with WWE, though. I, I... from what I saw, I don't think that's gonna gonna I, happen. I but. had actually just watched that old Royal Rumble. I've been watching old Royal Rumbles for some reason, and I remember, yeah, it was a big deal for Alberto Del Rio to win that one. WWE historically has has always put their money on these big, giant, hulking uh, Americans. Let's be honest. Yeah, you know, you have Hulk Hogan, the Ultimate Warrior, Randy Savage. I mean, those guys were pretty typical. Uh, even today, you're still looking at the likes of like John Cena and Randy Orton. I mean, it's triple h those guys are all kind of cut from the same mold if you will so it was it was a real big deal for alberto del rio to have that that opportunity and be pushed to that level yeah maybe that's that's why is because they were starting to realize kind of some of their fumbles so you know here we have a golden child from mexico let's push him up and get some attention i I will say watching wrestling now and and i've been watching a little bit off and on it is it is definitely more culturally varied than it was when i was growing up you got competitors from all over the world. I mean, and some some real big like the the W one of the one of the title holders right now. I think is German or 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 something like that. And he's and he's a monster. I'll tell you. But what was his name? Nikolai, the the big Russian Nikolai Volkov. Dude. Yeah, Volkov who uh, was from Georgia. He like was a, from Georgia, from but States. he was portrayed yeah. as a Russian. Yeah, even even the foreigners in in those days were from America. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about the Sid Vicious and Arn Anderson scissor incident, which (laughs) sounds dirtier than it is. (laughs) So after a show in Blackburn, England, Arn Anderson and Sid Vicious, along with a couple other wrestlers, went to a bar. Now this time, WCW, which was the primary rifle of WWF for a long time, 
Uh, they were not doing well financially, and a lot of the wrestlers weren't making very good money. Again, we talked about the money aspect of wrestling. Some of these guys don't make nearly enough for what they're doing. Many of them were lucky to make 100 or 200 bucks for a wrestling gig. Yeah, no. You, when you hear some of the story, like a lot of times, they might make $20 for a show or something. A little aside, my brother had a friend who actually went to a wrestling school not too far from here. And yeah, I think he was making like 25 bucks a show when he was doing it. Now, mind you, he was just getting started. Right, he was going... Right. He was performing like high school gyms, but there's no medical insurance involved. And he was trying to go to school during the day, go to wrestling school, and then do his shows. And I'd actually got to see him wrestle once. He was, you know, new. But I guess he fell asleep after a show on his way home and ran his car off the road. Wow. And, um, you know, he's got no medical insurance. Luckily, he was still young enough. His parents were covering him. But, like, I, I think he'd done some damage to his arm and shoulder and his, his parents made him give up they're like no you yeah, can't yeah if you, you can go to college or well, you can wrestle i mean let's face it football for example i mean they they brawl each other they have pads yeah these wrestling dudes don't well, and, and they make knee pads they maybe make quite a bit more than wrestlers do yeah so yeah. anyhow so anyway back to the story wcw was the main competitor of wwf and they were not doing financially well again like I said wrestlers were not making a lot of money and the conversation at the bar amongst the wrestlers which at that time included a very young steve austin uh, turned to their money woes and that the company wasn't getting good audiences, so they weren't making a lot of money at the time. Uh, Ric Flair was brought up as a guy who was making good money. And, you know, for the time, Ric Flair probably was. He was, I would imagine he was either world champion or the top of the roster. He was, you know, it's, it's Ric Flair. I mean, it, yeah. if you know Hulk Hogan, you probably know Ric Flair. Tempers started to flare, and then Sid lashed out uh, at the idea of of flair making so much money and singled him out as a as the problem with the company and the fact that the rest of them couldn't make money because they were giving it to flair <laughs> arn anderson who was at that time a very close friend of rick flair's they had toured and wrestled together for a long long time uh he took offense and they got into an argument which eventually would lead to sid throwing a beer bottle and at that point everybody else decided it is time to go vacate the building they they separated sid and, and arn and anderson and they said okay this is going to get worse if we stay so they all went back to their hotel now, at this point, accounts vary depending on who you talk to. Sid's manager at the time on television, Robert Parker, uh, he says that Sid dismantled a chair in his hotel room, grabbed a leg from said chair, and then went down to Arn Anderson's room. After faking a handshake, said, hey, hey, man, everything's cool. Sid then took the chair leg and bashed Arn Anderson over the head with it, <laughs> uh, which led to a brawl that spilled outside the room. At some point, Anderson had attempted to stab Sid with a pair of scissors, the two fought over them, with Sid eventually getting the scissors and stabbing Arn Anderson 20 to 30 times. Wow. Obviously, this caused Arn Anderson to lose a great deal of blood. And Parker implied at the time that Sid was wrestling without steroids, but had, had previously been using steroids, and he was bound to explode due to withdrawal symptoms. Now, Sid gives a different version of the story. According to Sid, Anderson was threatening to stab him with a broken beer bottle during their argument in the bar. So later, Sid went to Anderson's room with the intention of, you know, setting him straight and showing him who's yeah, boss. We going to have that. Uh, he did have the leg of the chair with him at that time. That, that part of the story still is there. However, Anderson opened the door with the scissors already in his hand. And Sid thought, you know, Anderson's going to stab me and basically knocked him out with a one shot and then noticed that Anderson had somehow accidentally stabbed him in the process of getting hit. 20 to 30 times? Yeah, uh, yeah. And then he grabbed the scissors and stabbed Anderson. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, now, according to fellow wrestler Too Cold Scorpio, a witness who was in the hallway, the entire place was covered in blood. Sid was kicking Anderson in the face and stabbing him over and over. Scorpio ran in to break up the fight, which Scorpio's not quite as big as Sid. Sid's another one of those guys that's like six and a half feet tall and 350 pounds. Or now, I'm just guy. envisioning, you got two big, big wrestlers with scissors and chair legs yeah. and you're going to jump in and okay good luck buddy now, according to scorpio anderson was in way worse shape than sid was and sid managed to walk off in a daze while anderson collapsed just due to blood loss uh, both were sent to the hospital sid had four stab wounds anderson suffered over 20 uh, both spent the night in the hospital and they had to be kept separated for the remainder of the tour and also went back to the u.s on two different flights so kept them boys separated. Sid was fired by WCW for this incident and Anderson was suspended. Now afterwards, Sid admitted that he has gone on to since apologized to Anderson and currently the two are on good terms. I don't know 
what kind of apology you'd have to give me if you stabbed me 40 times with a pair of scissors? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. The, it was an accident, the, dude. The first 19 times. <laughs> All right. I'm going to jump into another one. Uh, Brian Kendrick, uh, 2016. He, uh, Brian reappeared in the WWE Cruise Classic event. He'd already performed two stints with WWE, uh, among others like uh, the Ring of Honor. He was able to make some decent wins, showing that uh, he had caught his third win, so to speak, with WWE in his career. However, it was not to be. He lost his lackluster with, uh, within the business and slowly just kind of slumped to the little guy, the challenger type roles of wrestling. Now, he continued in this field until 2020, when his wrestling career just seemed to just totally get out of steam and there was no life left in it. He then, however, found a little niche in the backstage coaching for young talent and up-and-coming wrestlers. This was until 2022, when out of nowhere, he again reappeared like nothing had changed from the prime in his career several years before, becoming involved with NXT. He got into a skirmish with the bald-headed batty wrestling character Harland, and almost overnight, NXT stated a large promotional push for a special NXT event between none other than Brian Kendrick and Harland for January 25th, 2022. Now, mysteriously, in the weeks prior to this event, Brian Kendrick released his desire to leave NXT, in which six weeks was granted. So this event never took place after they promoted it, and he mysteriously just popped back up on the radar under their umbrella. At this point, it seemed no one really knew what Kendrick was going to do next. He had become a total wild card. That is, until only two hours after his release was granted by NXT. On the very same day, two hours after he was released, it was announced that All Elite AEW had picked him up and he was already scheduled in a dynamite event. Brian Kendrick would be facing John Moxley on February 2nd, 2022. Wow, this is moving fast, so try to keep up. It was a whirlwind of events that was only speeding up faster and faster. On the scheduled day of that event, the AEW Dynamite match on February 2nd of 2022, old comments came to surface by Brian Kendrick. Both video and commentary where Brian Kendrick stated he believed in numerous conspiracy theories (laughs) spread across the internet. Brian was heard in saying such things as, The Holocaust is overblown, and the Red Cross stated it was only 250,000 Jews that were killed, and the number was blown up to justify the creation of Israel. Also, the gas chambers were for delousing people. Some evidence suggests the Allies mocked up death camps even to explain the lie of the kills of the Nazis. Again going on, essentially publicly downplaying the horrific crimes of the Nazis during World War II. Needless to say, this did not set lightly, but there's more. He said the Sandy Hook shooting had all been faked. Oh, Jesus. He stated 911, completely faked or staged. The moon landing, totally fake and staged. Also, the killing of Osama bin Laden never happened. As a result, all of this spread across social media. AEW was quick to release him from the contract and dropped him fast and dropped him hard. One of AEW's major stars is of Jewish descent. Like, they're, I think he's their world champion right now. Yeah, that's so. very bad insult <laughs> to injury. Now, AEW representative posted to social media, We've been made aware of the apparent and offensive comments made in the past by Brian Kendrick. There's no room at A&E for the views expressed by Brian. We think it's best for all that Brian be pulled from tonight's card and events. As we gather more info, we'll announce the replacement bout for tonight's match ASAP. Now keep in mind, they had picked him up. They'd already promoted him. This is the night of the event, and all of this comes out. He's already made these comments. They've come forward. AEW representative makes this, you know, contradictory, this this statement back saying we've dropped him. Now, within hours of that, Brian Kendrick posts to social media personally. I spread the most vile comments without thinking of the damage it would cause. I will always regret this for the rest of my life. I'm truly sorry for the pain that I have caused. Again, on another location on Twitter, he made a a similar post. I apologize for all the hurt and embarrassment I have caused with my words. 
These are not my beliefs and have never nor will be my beliefs. And I cross the line. Now, folks, consider all of that took place in a period of 24 hours from being a backstage coach at WWE to being picked up, to being dropped, to being picked up by another company, (laughs) to have an event, to be dropped. Brian Kendrick has not reappeared in professional wrestling since that time. That is until the past Survivor Series where he presented the Ronda Rousey, protege of legendary Rowdy Roddy Piper, with Shotzi, in which Ronda Rousey insisted and requested for her involvement, he must be involved. Now, new things have come out that because of the way this was handled, this was a social media, could be, a social media smear campaign. Oh. So, I was left with a lot more questions than I did (laughs) answers. There's the side that obviously, you know, they heard him say these statements. So at some point he did make those statements, but possibly Ronda Rousey sounds like, and some of the others are like, this is part of a smear campaign where they wanted to take him out and take him down. So uh, believe what you want. Uh, She's kind of known for being dramatic herself, though. Like at one point in time, she plays the heel, the bad guy. She's the bad guy. You're supposed to boo her. And she apparently took it personally when people booed her. Like that's, <laughs> that's part of the, the role of the playing. job. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of wrestlers though. Um, I think John Tenta, who was known as earthquake, he was one of them. He was a really good dude and he loved his wrestling career and he loved, I, you know, interacting with children. And he was really bothered by the fact that he played such a horrific bad guy. They say it really took a toll on his psyche. The kids probably like crying yeah. and stuff. Like as kids he would past wanted him. nothing to do with him. And, and part of the reason he got into wrestling was to entertain children. So, uh, but she's one, yeah. I mean, she's known for a bit of drama, so who, who knows with her? Yeah. Well, I want to talk about uh, the Von Erich family curse. Now, if you, again, a lot of these, I'm gonna, if you follow wrestling, you, you would know the Von Erichs. The I've legend, heard of them. No, the legendary them wrestling well. family from Texas. Now, the real last name of the family is Adkison, but they use the ring name Von Erich. They've all used the ring name Von Erich, so I'm just going to go with Von Erich here. Uh, it was taken from the family patriarch when he portrayed the character Fritz Von Erich. A villainous German Nazi, which, again, they're from Texas, so. Yeah, yeah. Or America, at the very least. But yeah, so they all went by the name Von Eric after that. Now, when Fritz died in 1997 at the age of 68, five out of six of his sons had preceded him in death. That's, I can't imagine what, what that would be like. Tragically, his first son, Jack, died at the age of six when he was accidentally shocked and then drowned in a puddle. In 1959, outside of his Niagara Falls home. And did you say shot or shocked? Shocked. Electrical shocked. Yeah. yeah. David Von Erich, third of the Adkisson boys, had achieved a great deal of success in the wrestling business. Uh, I wanted to note he's, that he won the Missouri Heavyweight Championship on more than one occasion. Uh, he married a Candy McLeod on June 26, 1978, and they had a daughter, Natasha, on October 19, 1978. Unfortunately, the daughter died in infancy. Uh, and that would kind of lead to the end of the of that of David's first marriage. He would remarry to Patricia Miller on June eighth, nineteen eighty two, and David was later invited to wrestle in Japan. Now this is kind of considered to be a big honor amongst wrestlers. The opportunity to go wrestle in Japan one. The Japanese wrestling schedule is usually a little more aggressive, so it gives them plenty of opportunities to to you know practice their trade. But two uh, wrestling audiences in Japan take it way more serious than U.S. audiences do. To them, they are like watching a real spectacle, a real, you know, athletic combat. Now, they understand that wrestling is planned out in advance, but they appreciate the art of the wrestling and and all that. So a lot of people really enjoy wrestling over in Japan when they get the opportunity. Well, that's where the big sumo wrestling and everything comes in, which is a totally separate entity. But David would pass on February 10th, 1984 in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, and the death report says he died of acute enteritis, an inflammation of the small intestine. Although, according to wrestler Ric Flair in his autobiography, everyone in wrestling believes that it was a drug overdose that killed David. And that Bruiser Brody, that name comes up again, mm-hmm. uh, he was the one who found David in his hotel room. He took and disposed of the drugs down the toilet before police arrived to investigate. So, yeah, there's that. Now, Mike Von Erich, the fifth son of uh, Fritz, was known as the Inspirational Warrior. Mike replaced David when he passed away in the, in their feud against the fabulous Freebirds. Now, he never really wanted to be a wrestler. He actually wanted to run a camera for the, the World Class Championship Wrestling, I think was the name of it, down in Texas. Uh, but he was pressured to be uh, an in-ring performer by his father. It was sort of the family business. You got to get into it. Got to do it. Mike was married to Shani Garza on February 14th, 1985. 
And shortly after re- his wedding, he injured his shoulder on a tour of Israel. Uh, now he had F surgery to fix the, the shoulder injury, and it would lead to him suffering a, from toxic shock syndrome. He tried to return to the ring after a partial recovery, but he never really got back to himself after that surgery and the toxic shock syndrome. And he would eventually have to go on uh, to retire just because he never could quite recover from that. He would take a fatal dose of tranquilizers on April 12th, 1987. I have to assume they're, you know, disappointment of the family or whatnot. And, and losing your livelihood, I mean, that can't be easy on anyone. Right, right, right. Now, Chris was the youngest of the six Von Eric boys. Uh, due to his short stature at five foot four, having asthma and brittle bones that were prone to breakage, you can imagine it'd be difficult for him to break into the family business here. Now, he was he did. He became an in-ring performer. He was never able to reach the success of his father or his brothers. But, man, did he try. He loved wrestling. It was in his blood. He just wanted, you know, there was the That's family business. That's just a time bomb ticking to happen there. Yeah, he kept climbing into the ring and, and, and doing his best to so, despite suffering multiple injuries. And after several years of not being able to become as a success in the ring, uh, he became depressed and frustrated and, and heartbroken over the loss of his brother, Mike. At the age of 21, he shot himself. Now, Carrie Von Eric was the fourth of the Adkinson children, uh, known as the modern-day warrior or the Texas Tornado. He was by far the most well-known of the Von Eric children. Uh, he spent a majority of his career wrestling in Texas for WCCW. Uh, he would win the NWA World Heavyweight Championship from Ric Flair, of all people, at the David Von Eric Memorial Parade of Champions a tribute show to, dedicated to his brother. Uh, he would go on to wrestle with the WWF at the time, uh, and he would win the Intercontinental title at SummerSlam 1990, so arguably the most successful of them. Did quite well for himself. He married Kathy Murray on June 18th, 1983. They, they had two daughters, Holly and Lacey. Uh, now they would separate and, and, be, and were divorced on April 22nd, 1992. Uh, Lacey would go on to be a wrestler herself, but she stepped away from the business in 2010. Now, Carrie, uh, if I remember the story correctly, went home to, to Fritz's house. Uh, and he had a conversation with Fritz, and they said he was going to go for a walk on the ranch. Fritz didn't know Carrie took a gun with him and shot himself in the chest on February 18th, 1993, on his father's property. Now, Bret Hart stated in his autobiography that Carrie had told him about his plans at the time, uh, that he wanted to follow his brothers and that they were calling to him and that he believed that once his marriage had fallen apart, that his death was inevitable. Five out of six. Tragic now, and sad. Kevin, the surviving brother, I think he eventually got out of the wrestling business. I've seen interviews with him. He's a, I don't want to say sad. I don't know if that's the right word, but you can tell that his life has taken a toll. Oh, yeah. His experiences. After, after losing that many brothers and everything. I believe he moved to a, a piece of land on Hawaii, actually, and, and just sort of lived out his days peacefully, I guess. I, don't, I mean, money-wise, I don't know if he invested well or whatever, but he just kind of got away from it all. Now, on a positive note, Kevin has two sons, Ross and Marshall, and they have gone on to a great deal of success in the wrestling business, becoming tag team champions multiple times with different companies. Hmm. They, they, they wrestle under the name Von Eric, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine, as a father, I can't imagine losing you know, five out of six of your children before you pass away. And then somehow you would know that you were the one pushing them to do this stuff. Yes, yeah, so for some, like and they in, crumbled under the pressure. Yeah, in the case of the youngest brother who, who probably physically shouldn't have even tried. So I imagine that was rough. So my last little story here is on the death of Owen Hart. I feel that part of this story kind of fits in with what we're talking about. So Owen Hart was a member of the legendary Hart family and brother to Bret Hart. Again, like I said, if you know wrestling, you probably know the Hearts. You have Bret Hart, Owen Hart, um, their dad, uh, Stu, is a legendary wrestling trainer. Brother-in-law was the British Bulldog. I mean, the Hart family is, is incredibly well-known in Long wrestling. Long legacy. Now, Owen had a character that he portrayed that was known as the Blue Blazer. The Blue Blazer was kind of a slapstick comedy superhero character who... I mean, obviously, he's not a real superhero, but that was, you know, he had a blue mask and he a had cape. He had a cape, and like glittery cla- cape and stuff, yeah. And on the night of May 23rd, 1999, at the WWE Over the Edge pay-per-view held in Kansas City at the Kemper Arena, Owen was to be lowered to the ring in a harness rig and dropped from the ceiling. Now, the wrestler Sting in the competing company WCW had been doing this for a while. 
Sting had taken on a, a gimmick where he was emulating the crow from the movies, and he was the vengeful force fighting the NWO. And he would routinely drop down from the ceiling, attack a couple guys, maybe grab one, and then disappear into the ceiling. You know, he was this vengeful, heroic figure. They were sort of parodying that with the Blue Blazer character. Now, he was in the process of being lowered to the ring, and when he got close enough to the ring, he was supposed to act like he became entangled in the rig, and that would eventually force him to release a quick release they had installed, and then he would fall flat in the ring, and it'd be kind of a buffoonish, cartoony kind of effect. Just a few feet or, or whatever, yeah. yeah. Now, like I said, he would have to use a quick release. Now, a lot of experts since then have said they never would have used this quick release on this particular harness for this particular stunt. Uh, unfortunately for Owen, they don't know what exactly happened. They believe the cape got caught in the quick release, and that triggered it early, 75 feet above the ring. Mm. Underneath all the people there, the audience watching. Owen fell chest first onto the top rope, and then that trying to drop him into the ring. Viewers on television did not see this. They were showing a backstage segment at the time. However, those in attendance saw the whole thing. Uh, medical personnel were immediately called to the ring, where it was obvious that Hart was seriously injured. But now, at first, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of the people thought they thought this it was, was a, all just yeah, part, was part of, the, of the show. You know, so the yeah. ones that were there saw him fall, and they're like, "Ah, oh, look, yeah, he it, fell." And there was even laughing, and yeah, it took a while before they realized that this was serious. When the EMTs actually came out. As a matter of fact, there was an EMT straddling Owen on the gurney as they were taking him backstage, attempting CPR, trying to save his life. Uh, it was later revealed that he had severed his aorta on impact with the rope, uh, which resulted in severe bleeding and death within minutes. And Owen was only 35 when he passed away. Now, controversially, business decision, Vince McMahon and, and company decided to continue the show. Now, apparently they told people backstage, if you're not comfortable with going out there, you don't have to, but they all, you know, show must go on, I guess, as they say. The audience and the perform performers were obviously very affected by what had just happened. I had a, I actually worked with a guy who was watching the pay-per-view, and he said once they announced it, you it was noticeably different after that. Uh, a lot of wrestlers even say they, they barely were able to get out there. I think the main event was like Stone, Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Undertaker or something like that, and Austin was like, you know, in, in later interviews, he was like, I could barely walk out there. He goes, I don't know what I was doing. Well, and I'm having to imagine dropped from 75 feet, hitting the wrestling ropes, yeah. severing his aorta valve. I would think he would have been like spitting up blood and stuff. There could have still been blood and stuff up there. And yeah. hey, guys, get up there in that ring and just the well, show yeah, goes they had to, to clear the ring and stuff. And again, I'll throw out McMahon, you know, talk about some dark side of wrestling. Well, he's Vince is, is he, not a good dude. Yeah, he's right there in the throne. So viewers of the incident say as he fell that Owen was motioning to those in the ring to clear the way. Like there there was a referee standing not too far away and he was they they say he was clearly motioning to for him to get out of the way as he fell which many say was right in line with who Owen was. He was very concerned for others. He, he was a good guy by all accounts, loved to joke around with people, dedicated family man. He was two weeks away from moving into his dream home that him and his wife had just built with their children. This, and he was, by all accounts, he was within years of retiring. Owen had been very smart with his money, had invested soundly, and had never planned on wrestling being his lifelong career. He was going to retire and, and, and move in and just quit and take care of so his family. Close. Now, uh, those who work in the Kemper Arena, those who visit it, say, uh, especially if you're working up in the rafters of the arena, that they will feel a presence and sometimes see the blue blazer in the rafters uh, or sitting atop of the arena looking down on the, the area below where the ring would have been. And those who know Owen say it would be just like him to stick around and make sure that what happened to him didn't happen to anyone else. So those people who think that, he, that, that Owen's spirit is still there say that it's because he's protecting people, that mostly you only see him when you're working up in the rafters. Up high. Now, memory serves me correctly, the family ended up, did, you know, obviously there was lawsuits that impeded, and I think the family won $18 million uh, from they, the McMahons. Yeah, very large sum of money from the McMahons. And I believe Brett, for a long time, blamed Vince for what happened now. I think they made up eventually, and I know Brett's been on WWF or WWE television since then. But yeah, he uh, Brett said if he'd have been in the company, he absolutely would have told Owen not to do that. But he himself had had gotten hired by WCW not long before that, so hmm. you know he he would have he would have been there if he hadn't changed and, companies and witnessed it all. Yeah, wow. 
But yeah, the the real tragedy, like I said, I mean, he was just like two weeks away from moving into the dream home that him and his wife had had built, and and he was going to take a break from wrestling to spend time with his family, and and he was sort of ridiculed. I mean, he was a very talented wrestler, but people never saw him on the same level that they saw as Brett. Yeah. So they kind of saw him as like that little brother that was tagging along. Well, and he played that slapstick yeah. comedy kind of character. So yeah, very tragic. Well, I believe it's time for our nightmare headlines. Although admittedly, maybe not as interesting as tragic accidental death of Owen Hart or even the, the Chris Benet deal, Benoit. which Benoit, thank you, the Chris Benoit family murder history, which we both decided we wasn't going to touch tonight because there's been so much done on it. That whole list is long, but I wanted to focus on three from my own childhood fond memories. Uh, the first one is Macho Man Randy Savage. He's known for his gruff voice and flamboyant colors and sunglasses. And slinging Slim Jims. Slinging Slim Jims, fringed <laughs> outfits. His ringside manager, Miss Elizabeth, was actually his real-life wife prior to them even joining WWE. And then, uh, however, their characters were later married uh, on the show in the early 1990s, I believe. Sadly, Miss Elizabeth, the true wife of Macho Man Randy Savage, lost her life to a drug overdose in 2003. Now it was Lex Luger found her. I believe you're correct. Yes, Lex Luger. <coughs> now, Randy Savage uh, did remarry uh, many years later in 2010 to his second wife, Lynn. However, the couple would not get much time together. Apparently very, very happy, according to the things I've seen. The I've pictures seen and stuff I saw, they, were, they seemed I, very happy. I've seen interviews with his brother and said that he had kind of made peace with who he was and his place in the world. But in 2011, Savage died due to a car crash head on with a tree. However, the crash was not the cause of his death, but rather what was presumed to be a heart attack. Now, Macho Man Randy Savage was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2015, and his brother, Lanny Pofo, I believe is the way you pronounce it, was there to accept that for him. There is a story that said that he was involved in Stephanie McMahon when she was 15 years old, and that is why he was not mentioned on WWF television for many, many, many years. Uh, but that's an alleged, like there's, there's no proof of that that I'm aware of. Okay. Interesting. So dark side of the ring, you know, second one I wanted to bring to light is the junkyard dog. Sylvester Ritter was born in Wadesboro, North Carolina. He played school football, but when he was overlooked, he decided to shift gears slightly into the wrestling scene. He found his footing in the deep South wrestling arenas, and it was there that he first took on the, the name junkyard dog. He sported large, a large leather dog collar with large dangling chains from it. And now in 1984, he started his professional career with the WWF Wrestling Federation, later transitioning to WWE. He never won any big belts, however, continued to be a fan favorite, a return character for many, many years, enabling him to be in several of the WrestleMania events during the 1980s. I, I, I actually read an article about the Junkyard Dog. The reason he never achieved the level of popularity or success that he was accustomed to is that his, his wrestling career was already on the decline, and apparently he was having uh, he, was, he was relying on painkillers to make it through most matches at that point. Oh, okay. Well, in some of these WrestleMania events that he, uh, he went up against and defeated such people as the Iron Sheik and even Randy Savage, JYD, as he was often nicknamed, retired from the wrestling career in 1993, but tragically died of a car accident at only 45 years old in 1998. To add insults to injury, he was driving home from a local high school graduation event of his daughter, LaToya, but never made it back home. In 2004, his daughter, LaToya, was able to accept her father's induction into the WWE Hall of Fame. And last but not least, the three of my picks, The Ultimate Warrior was a super popular wrestler from the 1980s through the 1990s and, and even beyond. He's most often remembered for his colorful, lined face paint and tiny bikini briefs and those really <laughs> uncomfortable, tied, colorful strings tied around his bulging biceps. The, the guy would run to the ring. He'd be exhausted before he ever hit the ring. But, I mean, again, seemingly endless energy, too, apparently, which... Yes. Again, he was popular in the 80s and 90s. Who knows how he achieved that, but... 
as as Bill was saying, most wrestlers would enter the ring slowly, methodically, but the Ultimate Warrior was just known to just sprint, <laughs> just running from backstage to the ring, often making circles around the rings and then grabbing one of the, the ropes and shaking it and just acting like some sort of a madman with just energy just pouring out of him. His most notable calls to fame would be defeating the Honky Tonk Man in under 30 seconds in 1988's SummerSlam. Uh, his biggest claim to fame undoubtedly was beating Hulk Hogan at the 1990 WrestleMania VI event. If I remember right, it was the first time any man had held two titles at the same time, the Intercontinental and the World title. And, and again, at the time, Hulk Hogan was the pinnacle of the, wrestling. Yeah, the wrestler. Then, the following year, he defeated Macho Man Randy Savage in WrestleMania Seven. He even originated those Slim Jim beef stick commercials that Randy Savage became famous for. Yep, Ultimate Warrior did that first. Then, he just disappeared into the shadows for several years. There was a lot of rumors, but making just a few vague appearances. The story, as I understand it, is he was going into SummerSlam, I believe, and he was supposed to lose the title, and he was willing to do that, but he told Vince he would only do it if he paid him an X amount more money on his contract. And so Vince agreed on a handshake, I believe. Oh, here we go. And he went to the ring, and then when he came back, he looked him in the eye and told him he was fired because you don't do that to Vince McMahon. And that's uh-huh. sort of what happened. He, you could say he priced himself out of the business. Well, after making just a few vague appearances during that time frame, uh, then he came forward to accept his induction into the WWE Hall of Fame on April 5th, 2014, and also announcing he had just signed a deal with the WWE to become one of their wrestling ambassadors. However, it wasn't meant to be. Just three days later after the announcement, the Ultimate Warrior would pass away of a heart attack at the age of 54. It's really sad. Like he'd he'd come back and he was embraced, and then yeah, it was like right after that. And they said that even when he would make those few vague appearances, he was a totally different person. He, I mean, just totally. It, obviously, I, age had affected him. But well, I was gonna say I've seen the video. Demeanor. I've seen the video of of him in the ring. I, I, he was on Raw after WrestleMania. One, he didn't look good. He he, you know, time had not been kind to him, and and he didn't look healthy. But his speech, at, at one point, he says something about, like, now as, as a man draws his final breath, you know, all he has left is the mark he's made. And, and, and I mean, his speech was about, like, the end. Like, it, it very much felt it, it, was, it was a suitable final speech. I'll say that. And there seems to be a lot of artists that way. I mean, I mean through the years, we'll go over to music. Johnny Cash, some of the last songs yeah. that he recorded, it was oh, like yeah, yeah. he knew he was not Kenny Rogers. It's almost like they have this, they know it's coming, you know. So my headline, taken from WrestleZone on March 10th, 2023. Chris Jericho doesn't care about political affiliations, but he loves cryptozoology. (laughs) Uh, Chris Jericho is a multiple-time world champion with different companies. uh, Wrestled for WWF, WCW, uh, AEW. He wrestled in Japan. He's wrestled in Mexico. Uh, I've actually, I'm, I'm in the process of reading one of his autobiographies. He's got like four that he's published. Wow. Uh, he was my brother's favorite wrestler for a long time growing up. And at that WWF No Mercy that we went to, it was the first time he'd won a world championship with WWF. Mm. He won the unified title, I believe, at that point. And on top of being a, a professional wrestler, he's also a rock star with the band Fozzie, an actor which he was in the movie Jane Silent Bob reboot, I believe. An author, a podcaster, and a game show host. So he, he, you talk about of all a multi-talented guy here. Uh, but his interests don't stop there. He's also a fan of the paranormal conspiracy theories and more. Jericho recently appeared on the podcast of The Session with Renee Paquette, and there he talked about how he became friends with fellow wrestler John Moxley. Quote, That's one of the reasons why Mox and I became friends, and because he's into that too. He told me he had a ghost experience in one of those creepy hotels in England that we stayed at. He told me all about it. He goes on to say, I was always obsessed with horror movies and ghosts and the paranormal. You know, kind of the cryptozoology, which is what Bigfoot is. And I was really obsessed with monsters, lake monsters. Uh, He also talked about the multiple unidentified flying objects that were shot down around the time of the Super Bowl. (laughs) But then he believed that these stories may also have been used as a distraction 
to tell pull the attention off of something else that was happening as at we the have time. talked in our podcast yes uh he also went on to talk about how he was politically neutral and again not to get into politics very much but apparently he interviewed donald trump jr at trump tower and people strongly criticized him about that uh, but he, he made sure to point out that he's politically neutral. He also went on to interview Andrew Yang, which is sort of the, the opposite side of the political spectrum. And But he said he, he didn't get nearly as much hate and anger directed in his direction for Andrew Yang as he did uh, <laughs> Donald Trump Jr. But that he doesn't care about your political affiliations, that he considers himself a journalist when he's doing his podcast, and that he wants to present fair and unbiased yeah, uh, presentation. Chris Jericho, again, another legendary name in wrestling. And I wanted to not talk about somebody dying, so. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, we hope that you've uh, enjoyed our dive into the dark side of wrestling. And let me assure you, we've barely scratched the surface. There's a lot, a lot, if you go out there and dig. Uh, this was probably one of my more difficult podcast <laughs> notes to put together, not for lack of information. It was just like, which rabbit hole am I going to go down? Yeah, no, uh, obviously. As you can tell, I could talk about wrestling at length for a long time. I like the behind-the-scenes aspect of wrestling. That's why I like wrestler autobiographies. I like to kind of understand how it works behind the scenes. But, yeah, it's uh, and that was kind of a departure from our norm here. But Well, this was Bill's Wish, and we hope that you've enjoyed <laughs> listening to the dark side of wrestling. Thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, two screams were heard, loud enough for the entire locker room to hear. Uh, and Tony Ratliff, Tony Ratliff. <laughs> so fellow wrestlers Dutch Mantel and Tony Atlas have gone on to say that that in the seventies when Brony, oh, Brony, <laughs> My Little Pony, Brony. <laughs> in the nineteen seventies when Brony and Gonz, I said it again. You said it again. Uh, in Brody. the nineties. <laughs> Want to take a time to thank the people that helped bring this all together. Uh, Alex Tudor, you can almost call him our producer at this point. Sarah Tudor, who also helps with some of the technical stuff. I want to take a moment to extend thanks to Eric for letting us use his space to record in kind of our makeshift studio. I, in turn, would like to thank Bill for, one, putting up with me and uh, <laughs> using this camaraderie to do something we both very much love and enjoy doing. And thank Bill's family for allowing him to spend all the time to work and clean up our recordings and present them in what uh, you hear in the final uh, terms, uh, the final edition, if you will. And I'd like to thank all of you for continuing to, to listen. I know we've got some loyal followers out there. We do this as a labor of love, but we're, we're happy that there are people that enjoy it as, hopefully as much as we do. Thank you very much. <laughs>